Living in Virginia, you're in the fast lane on the information superhighway. We've invested $3 billion in Virginia's broadband network to give you one of the fastest internet connection speeds in the world, so you can build relationships, bring new business to our state, and meet the future of education. It's amazing what we can do together. Visit VCTA.com to learn how broadband connects the Commonwealth. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have Delegate Chris Collins with us this morning from the City of Winchester and surrounding counties. Thank you for being here, sir. We know you're very busy. This is the last week before you go home Saturday. Exactly. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, uh, what were your expectations uh, coming here this session and how have they worked out? Well, it was interesting coming down. Uh, this is only my third session. Uh, and prior to this, there were 66 Republicans and now there's only 51. So it was, uh, it was a lot of, uh, and of course we did not know if we were going to have 51 up and until the gavel fell for the first day of the session. So my expectations were, let's see what we can get done. Uh, I, I've been pretty good about working across the aisle to make sure that we get the things done that need to get done for the Commonwealth, the budget, law enforcement, public safety, education. Uh, so my expectations were that we were going to have, we're, it's going to be a different feel down here, and it has been. So let's talk about uh, the budget, because mm -hmm. uh, right now there are uh, about uh, 10 to 12 people working uh, to uh, uh, resolve the differences between the House version and, and the mm -hmm. Senate version. Uh, uh, you're supposed to go home Saturday. I'm sure you will regardless of, of what happens, but in your opinion, what's likely to happen given, given the significant impasse with Medicaid expansion? All indications are right now is that we will not have a budget on Saturday. Uh, there's a $600 million separation between the House budget and the Senate budget, which is Medicaid expansion. Uh, it is also the indication that we will probably not adjourn on Saturday, but we'll go, go into special session as we continue to work on the budget. But we, we shall see. Uh, I'm not one of the conferees. Uh, they generally go um, and sit together in a room, and then they report out when they feel like there's something to report out. And they generally keep their conserv conservations conversations to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not a lot of sharing. But that is the indication that we've gotten. No. No matter what happens, by July 1st, the Commonwealth of Virginia will have a budget, unlike your friends in Washington, D.C. Correct. Well, we will, we will have something. I, I'm sure that's plenty of time. I'm sure we'll have something figured out. If there's still an impasse, there, there are other things that may happen between now and then to solve that impasse um, and just make good votes on the floor. Um, just because you have the Senate saying one thing and the House saying something else doesn't necessarily mean there aren't budget amendments that may, may or may not come in. The difficulty is, and I come from local government, is without a budget, local governments right now are trying to determine what their tax rate should be, what their spending is going to be, what their education budget is going to be. Um, and there's a lot of, with a $600 million difference, and, and a lot of that money is coming to localities. They don't know what money they're going to get and not get. If the Senate version passes, that's less money. If the House uh, budget passes, that's more money. Uh, so it's very hard for localities, so I think we got to be very sensitive to our localities that they're going to have to reopen their budgets because uh, they have to get their budgets done before the July 1st deadline as well. And of course, localities, especially boards of supervisors, depend primarily on the real estate tax, do they not? Correct. So they have the real estate tax. That's how they generate their local funds. But of course, they're being supplemented by the state, particularly in education, law enforcement, um, and for other key, uh, key priorities. But some of that's going to be increases. One budget has uh, pay raises for teachers, one has more pay raises for teachers. So which one is it going to be? And uh, so that's going to be a difficulty for our localities, and I'm sure when I go home, I've already spoken to my board of supervisors and town council members and let them know this is the situation, and I, I try to give them some guidance on, on how, where they need to go now. Now, for the first time, and I, and I think part of this relates to the fact that there's only a 51-49 split now, mm -hmm. 
between Republicans and Democrats in the House of Delegates. But for the first time, the, uh, the House did adopt Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. Uh, you voted against that. I understand mm -hmm. that. Can, can you explain to us your reasons why you voted against Medicaid expansion? Sure, absolutely. There's a lot of things. Well, first of all, uh, right before that vote came down, the Trump administration came out and said they were not going to honor waivers. Um, now, that's one person, one budget, one budget individual from the Trump administration, but they, he said he was speaking for the, Trump, for, the, for the administration itself. So if we don't get the waivers, and then, let's talk about that waiver sure. because that, that would impose a work requirement, would Correct. it not? Okay. And the idea is that th that would limit the number of people who could actually be on Medicaid uh, or, or qualify for the program. Obviously, they have to, there's, if there's a work requirement, that means you're either gainfully employed or trying to find employment. Um, and if you're someone who is capable of having a job, you would not qualify to be put on the program. The anticipation would be that that may reduce the number by 100 to 150,000 people that would be then qualify for it. So that reduces your cost, obviously. So having work requirements and having some other uh, waivers that are, that are involved, and several other states have done that. Virginia's not the first one. We're following other, other, uh, uh, other states, what, what they have done. And, uh, but if the, the administration says we're not going to do that, then those waiver requirements go away, and then we go from trying to uh, in, insure 300,000 to 450 to f half a million people. Um, the other issue that I had was that the federal government has said that they're, they're going to, they'll fund 90 percent with the other 10 percent being coming from uh, the state. The House budget says we'll get that 10 percent by having what's called a provider tax, which we're taxing. It's, it's a user fee. Let's just, they, it's a tax, but they want to call it a user fee. And basically what it says is that if you use a hospital, there's a 10 percent um, fee assigned to your services. Now, not every hospital has to pay that. Not every doctor's office has to pay that. So we're not sure who qualifies, who doesn't qualify. So that's, that's another, if that 10% is not covered by that provider fee, that's money that the taxpayers are going to have to come up with to, to make up that 10%. Um, an additional issue is that the administration, with their most recent Medicaid budgets, make it look like they want to do a 50-50 split meaning they're going to drop below the 90% to go to 50-50. Now, within our budget, we said there's a, tr there's a taxpayer trigger that if the federal funding drops below 90%, we, we stop using the program. So that means that let's, let, let's take the very conservative estimate of 300,000 individuals that are on Medicaid expansion. That means that 300,000 individuals would no longer be on Medicaid expansion and be automatically kicked off the program, which I either th is either... Uh, which is an issue for me, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so for a lot of those reasons, and, and I'm all in favor of the healthcare um, system. My wife's a nursing professor. I am I, I'm a former respiratory therapist. And, but the issue with Medicaid expansion is that it's only solving one leg of a three-legged stool. We're, we're giving people insurance, but we're not, we're, we have done no effectuation to costs or access. And, I, and no one wants to come to the table and talk about it um, because as long as the ACA is out there, Dem Democrats refuse to come to the table and say, we got the ACA, just take the ACA, and then maybe we'll come to the table and talk. And for other people on my side of the aisle, I'll say, well, whatever we do, we're talking about, they're talking about uh, Obamacare, and we, we, can't, we can't expand Obamacare. So it, is, it has been a stalemate when it comes to how are we really providing health care. And one of the, one of the points and I don't want to belabor this, obviously this is a, it's a, it's a major issue, but um, we have no competition in health insurance. Mm -hmm. If you turn on the TV for an hour, you will see how many car insurance commercials or home insurance commercials. You don't see health, health insurance commercials. And what I tell people is I'll believe we have a free market when I see flow bundling home, auto, and health all into one health insurance. And so for a lot of those reasons, I think this is, this, this is just a, it's a bad path to go down, and I think that we can do better. Now, who, who, who currently are beneficiaries of, of Medicaid? The, the elderly, as I understand mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, pregnant women, mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. primarily, th those are the beneficiaries of, of the traditional Medicaid Correct. plan. And that they're currently on. Right. You know, uh, and I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. If you're below a certain income level, or you're disabled, or there's a variety of other reasons, you qualify. So it's, it's not as if there's people out there without insurance that would not otherwise qualify for insurance. All this would do is in, 
increase the number of people that would be able to then enroll in Medicaid um, for a variety of other reasons. So, you know, a healthy 20-year-old um, who may be working, uh, working a job where they don't have any health insurance benefits would now be qualified to be on Medicaid. Um, and so that's a laudable goal. But I also think that we're, we're, we haven't solved the other, under, uh, other underlying issues with healthcare. Now, as I understand it, there were a number of other proposals generated on the Senate side, which are under consideration now, that would deal with limited uh, populations mm -hmm. in, in terms of Medicaid. Uh, is that something that you have addressed as well? Yes, I think there is a, uh, it's an estimated about 60,000 individuals, and it's dealing with the IDD waivers, which is dealing with disability waivers and intellectual disability waivers. Um, with Medicaid expansion, and there is some money out there from the federal government to, to do those kind of waivers. And I'm, I'm in favor of that because that's a very limited, those are, those, that is a population which we've been trying to assist and trying to help in Virginia, and I have voted year after year after year to increase funding for those waivers um, because having access for mental health is something that we need, we need to do a better job of. So some of those Senate proposals are really are, are good ideas. I'm hoping that uh, they prevail. Uh, but we shall see. Now, what do those waivers do exactly? They're basically what they're saying is you're going to the federal government and saying, I, here, I, I'm putting a form in and I'm asking for money, okay. and, but that money's only for this, this block of individuals. It's more like block grants versus actual just a flow of money coming from, coming from uh, D.C. Now, the, the, the other uh, uh, issue that's been around for, for several years relates to the closing of some of the uh, training centers mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth. Uh, there was a, uh, an agreement entered into several years ago with the Department of Justice, but mm -hmm. I know there's been some concern from a lot of parents mm -hmm. who have adult children mm -hmm. who are still institutionalized and they don't want those training centers closed. Correct. Uh, and I have a former law partner whose brother has been long-term, um, and he and I have communicated this on, on, at, at length. And it is a, it's a slow and laborious process, you know, to get, to get from point A to point Z when you're dealing with this, when you're opening up, shutting down, transferring, um, and it's a process that we continue to work on. But the, yeah, there, there is a concern of, am I going from the frying pan into the fire? Right, right. Um, and in my, loca my area, I've worked very closely with, with our providers to make sure that we're, we're doing the best we can. Now, has the opioid crisis uh, affected your district at all? Significantly. Um, but also, we're the, the tip of the spear in Virginia when it comes to the opioid crisis. We have, we have put forth a lot of measures that a lot of other localities around the state are following. Um, we're following some other localities as well, like with our drug court and with some treatment programs. And uh, with, we have a drug coalition, uh, which is a collaboration of law enforcement, courts, and hospital, which has done an effective job of finding this is working, this is not working. And it's a collaboration rather than law enforcement says, well, here's what we're going to do. And then the hospital says, well, well we're going to do this. It's an actual working together. And it's, and it's been significant in bringing down um, a lot of our opioid use. But we have still, our fatality rate is still, for, for our populace, is, is significant. And it's due to our location of Baltimore. Uh, we're only two hours away from Baltimore. Um, I have many clients. I have clients that have died since I've been down here from overdoses. And uh, by and far, they're, coming, they're going up to Baltimore beat where heroin is cheap and, and abundant. So it's a public health crisis, but it's also a criminal justice issue as well. It is. Um, as we know, the, the, just like with alcoholism, addiction to, the opioid issue is an addiction issue. Um, and it is, we, we need to address it as both ways, both as criminal and an addiction issue. Uh, and as long as they're an addict, they will continue to want to use. And so we need, to, we need to just be able to recognize that as a, as a society. So I, I take it as we uh, uh, put additional uh, restrictions on the, pres the prescribing of opioids, uh, folks are turning to heroin. Correct. So what the normal, I shouldn't say normal, the, the transition is that an individual gets some, like, uh, gets Oxycontin for a, a twisted ankle. And then the, they become addicted to the Oxycontin. They're only get, allowed to give so many Oxycontin. Then they start trying to find other Oxycontin. And then heroin becomes a little bit more, it, it's, a, it's a transitional process. Um, and the number of people who have died from heroin overdoses who never used heroin except after their injury, you know, a, a shoulder injury or things like that nature, a back injury, 
um, and they're just using it to, to get the fix um, for, their, for their addiction um, is quite significant. There's a, there's a great video, and I believe it was in 2001 or 2002, where um, the pharmaceutical companies were testifying in front of Congress, saying, oh, OxyContin is the new miracle drug, and we're seeing less than a 1% addiction rate in our trials. And that was a lie. And here we are. So, and you see doctors and pharmacists finally, uh, you know, decade, decades later, mm -hmm. saying, all right, we, we now know there's better ways to handle this um, than dealing with this. And so we, we're seeing a change in how we're medicating our, medicating our populace and how we're treating pain. So another public health issue that you've been uh, pursuing relates to autism. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that. So um, autism is something that's very near to my heart. Uh, my son is, uh, is autistic and, a, the, and I've dealt with the autistic um, community and tried to work very, very hard with that. Uh, one of the bills I put in this year, and Senator Jill Vogel put one in the Senate, was to extend coverage through insurance um, past the age of 10. Right now, it caps out at, at 10 years of age. Um, mine would remove that cap, um, and Senator Vogel's capped it at 18 years. Um, due to budget issues, um, as well as some, some other um, issues that were out, both out of her control and my control, neither one of those bills were successful this year. Um, and with Medicaid expansion, that doesn't necessarily cover autism care. So uh, both uh, Senator Vogel and I were both very disappointed that our bills did not succeed, um, but we will probably do attempt it again next year. Now, in your other life, uh, you, you do a lot of criminal defense work, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a bill dealing with the uh, threshold for larceny. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about why that bill is important. So we, the current larceny threshold is $200, and 1979 was about the last time that we did it. So would that make it a felony? Yes, okay. I'm sorry. So if you steal more than $200, it's considered a felony in, in Virginia. Under $200, it's considered a misdemeanor. We doubled it in 1979 from $100 to $200, um, and then we have not touched it since. Um, and the, the Commonwealth has been resistant to raising it. Um, but the courts have kind of taken care of it, where they have looked at the individual and said $200, you sold groceries or, or whatever. Um, but then this year, we, I, I put in a bill, Les Adams put in a bill to try to address the larceny threshold because it, it really, the pressure was starting to, trying to mount. You know, we're coming up on 40, almost 40 years that this, that this has been sitting around. And uh, it, it was kind of, it was time to look at this. And the governor's office said, well, if you raise it to $500, we'll give you restitution reform, meaning that there's individuals, there's over $8 million owed to citizens, not the courts, not the mm -hmm. Commonwealth, you and I, who are victims of crime, whether or not from salt and batteries with medical bills or whether or not from larceny, that is uncollected. And so this new law that we put in place with the restitution, excuse me, with the uh, larceny threshold um, will then make it easier uh, to collect and to make sure that our the defendants um, who've been convicted of these crimes will continue to make payments and make their victims whole. Uh, so those two combinations together were what got the dam broke um, on larceny reform. Great, let's talk a little bit about transportation issues. You do mm -hmm. serve on the uh, transportation uh, committee and I know that there's been a lot of angst up in Northern Virginia, but you have a major interstate that mm -hmm. is really crowded with a lot of trucks. There are a lot of accidents and fatalities. I know you had a conversation with the new Secretary of Transportation about that issue. Where are we in terms of improving I-81? Well, the difficulty with any time that you talk about highway infrastructure is, first of all, you need to get money to do a study. And then once you do a study, you need more money to do um, the, the, the research. So you, you can do a study to say, well, we need an extra lane, and then you need to go out and do impact uh, studies, environmental impact and everything else. So even if uh, we had the money, it'd take five years before a shovel hits the dirt. So we've started that process. 40% uh, of the tractor-trailer traffic in the Commonwealth of Virginia goes through the Interstate 81 corridor. 40% of 40%. It. It's a high commerce area. The difficulty is that it is a valley. It is, it is a bookend. Um, on either side by, by a mountain. So there is no side roads. There's, not, there's no other than Interstate 81, there's really no good alternative 
for tractor trailers to use or for vehicles for that matter. Uh, Route 11 is an old two lane road. Right. And if you drive through the small, some of the small towns, uh, Middletown, Stephen City, Strasburg, you keep going down the road, mm -hmm. those houses are right up against the, the asphalt. So there's no place to expand those roads. Um, and also, all those roads go right through battle, Civil War battlefields. Mm -hmm. So we have put a study in place this year um, to look at all of Interstate 81, find out where the trouble spots are, and try to come up with, there's a working group to come up with a plan to say, here's what we think we can do that might be able to alleviate these, these issues, some short-term, long-term uh, goals, and what the funding measures are for those things. So that, that is, uh, that's the one thing we got done this year. So how does smart scale relate to this? Once you get the money in place, then smart scale uh, has to be looked at, I take it. Right. So smart scale, for those of you who don't know, is a mathematical scoring system um, that we use to try to determine what projects are more important than others. Um, the smart scale came into being when we raised the sales tax by 0.3 percent. Um, they call it the transportation tax, uh, I believe in 2013. And so what we found was smart scale didn't work the first time we did it. Localities like Interstate 81 and some other localities were not we're not getting high enough scoring, so they redid it. And we found that that didn't work either, so we've run it, redone it again. And of course, once again, that didn't work either. So it is a, uh, that's one of the things we continue to look at, is that our projects are not scoring high enough for whatever reason through the smart scale uh, mathematical process. And so that's one of the jobs that I believe I have with single transportation is to say we need to reevaluate this, and, and we're working on that to find out why th scoring is working so well for these roads in Northern Virginia, but not Interstate 81, which everyone recognizes is a priority. Uh, the Secretary of Transportation said so. So why is it that it, it doesn't, doesn't rise to the, the cream rise to the top? But um, so we'll, we'll be working on that project this summer as well, and that's as part of this research study. Uh, does the research study include a proposal to tax some of these 18-wheelers? I believe so. There, there was a, uh, there's some conversation about tolling tractor trailers on, interstate, on, the, on the Interstate 81. There's also there was conversation, I believe, dealing with gas tax. Um, all of that is part of a study. None of that got, there was no tax increase, there's no tolls voted on. It's all part of a, how would this play, how would this work, who would that affect, what, what kind of monies do we think that would raise. Um, and they're supposed to get back, back with us next year with a report. And I take it that would also include uh, proposals dealing with uh, private-public uh, partnerships. Correct. Um, the difficulty with the private-public pri partnerships for the Interstate 81 is that it is the limited space. Um, it's very difficult for them to build a third lane and, and the length of highway and where they're going to build that and things of that nature. You've seen the hot lanes right. on 66 and 495 and 395. Uh, which have worked to some degree. Uh, the tolls on the inside of the beltway right now, I think you've seen that have not worked that well um, for a variety of reasons. But yeah, I think there's, I think there's going to be a couple of proposals made by a couple of private organizations coming in and saying we could do this, and this is what it would, this is what we could do for you. Now you have a, 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 a statewide uh, perch, so to speak, in, in, in viewing these transportation issues. Uh, in general, how do you think those public-private partnerships are, are working uh, other than inside the Beltway, I-66, that right. issue? And of course, we've, we've had similar issues in uh, the Virginia Beach area as right. well. There, so as with any private corporation, they're there to make a profit. Uh, the, the, the issue in, in the Virginia Beach area is, I believe, um, that there I don't think anybody did anything wrong down there. I just don't think that people read that contract as closely as probably should have. What's going on the inside of the Beltway on 66 is basically that's just volume traffic, and it may it may go down, it may go back, it may stay the same. It, we'll see. But um, the example that I think is a good example is on 495. That seems to be working on 495. The the express lanes that they put on 495. Virginia said it was going to cost about $2 billion and they were going to have to condemn about 150 properties in order to do that expansion. A private company came in, did it for $1.2 million, $1 billion, and only had to condemn, I think, 60 properties. So they were able to do it better than VDOT. Not saying that they're, they're smarter, but they, they were able to get it done um, at almost half the cost and with almost half the, uh, the condemned properties. And they seem to be working, and I think people are, are generally happy with those, those hot lanes on 495. 
Um, so I think in some places it is shown to work. In other places we need to have, but you always need to have an eye towards, um, you know, especially when you're building roads. Uh, that road's going to be there forever. It's not like it's a contract renew every year. That they're building that road and it's a long-term contract. So we have to be very, very careful. Now, part of your district includes uh, the inland port mm -hmm. at Front Royal. Why is that important? So the inland port, um, is, just for people who don't know, we have the port down in Norfolk, um, and then they have trains that run out of there, and they go to Front Royal, which is the inland port, where they're offloaded onto tractor trailers. So what that does is it removes a lot of tractor trailers from going from Norfolk any place else in the state. All these, all these products moved up north of the Virginia. And then they're offloaded on those tractor trailers. But they're also loaded. So we have a lot of factories and a lot of industry that otherwise would want, want to locate in Norfolk because that's where it's cheaper um, for transportation costs. But now that those transportation costs are also cheaper and their, their, their leases are cheaper, their taxes are cheaper, um, by being up in northern, up, up, up in the true northern Virginia, um, as well as Maryland, as well as West Virginia, which is just across the border. So we've had a lot of industry growth, uh, rubber made, American Woodmark, uh, Hood, uh, milk production, as well as um, Johnson and Johnson, have all moved into the area to start manufacturing, and they put the products on the train, and it goes down to the port, and it's put on a ship and, and, and sent around the world. Of course, that Port of Virginia is a huge economic driver to the commerce of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Absolutely. Um, they put $300 million into this Port of Virginia this year uh, in the budget. And it, it is all for, it, the, the Port of Virginia was the first deep port on, this, uh, on the East Coast. Um, so we, we were taking the super tankers that were coming through before anybody else. And so we had those contracts and we had that. Um, and then, like I said, with the rail, with the rail cars and with CSX and Norfolk Southern, they've been great partners, and we have been able to take a lot of trucks off the roads um, and bring a lot of industry to Virginia. Uh, another proposal that uh, included a bipartisan tent, so to speak, related to an agreement between the governor and the General Assembly about regulatory reform. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk to us about uh, what that will do in terms of reducing unnecessary and burdensome regulation on small business. So I'll give you a good example. Uh, I've been dealing with the uh, ABC commissioner on, on a licensing issue. Alcohol beverage uh, control. Al alcohol beverage control. And uh, I said, I think you should be, we should be able to do what I want to do because of this code section. And he said, he took the code section, flipped it, and he says, yes, but I like using this code section. So we, and then last year I did a DUI uh, bill, it was 48 pages long because we had about 30 code sections that we had to amend. So there is a lot of regulations. We add, we don't take away. Um, and so I think that going forward, we can look, if you're, putting one, if you're putting a new alcohol regulation in, you should be able to look back and say, well, you know, here's three that are now, we don't either use or they're pointless that we should remove. Um, so I think that that's a good thing, um, and I believe that that, that will be a, that'll be a good movement for uh, the Commonwealth. Great. Well, thank you for being with us today, Delegate Chris Collins. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.